Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and just a couple of announcements. First of all, the next advanced study is on June 23rd and I'm going to be talking about detox programs. So I get emails about this stuff all the time, you know, do, do you, what do you think of colon cleanses and what do you think of juice fasting and some things are actually pretty good, some things not so much, so we're going to have a good thorough discussion of the good and the bad and the ugly, all right? So June 23rd. And then check our member site. We're posting new stuff every week on really, really good quality, a lot of it video content. So uh, anyway, make sure you check that out if you're a member of the Wellness Forum. And I'm real happy to announce you can go to my own website, drpampopper.com. And um, I've got a great video talking to Dell about weight loss and um, a little presentation on the five things that I talk about that surprise people the most when I give lectures or do conference calls and that sort of thing. So drpampopper.com, send me an email, let me know what you think. All right, I wanna talk about two things today, really interesting topics, and the first one, has to do with carbohydrates because carbohydrate bashing has become such a great sport in our uh, low carb world. People talking about um, eating animal fat and protein as the staples of the diet. So carbohydrate bashing is what these people do. But I've been talking for years and so have my colleagues about the benefits of a carbohydrate rich diet. In fact, your diet should be about 75% carbs. And of course, what I've been talking about for years is eating a high carb diet causes weight loss, it's one of the great tools for stopping and, pre and reversing heart disease and type 2 diabetes and common degenerative conditions. But as it turns out, not only are carbs good for your physical body, they can affect your mood. Researcher Judith Wortman, who is director of the Women's Health Program at MIT Clinical Research Center, and her colleagues report that carbohydrates stimulate serotonin production. And serotonin does a lot of things. Here's just a short list. It, of course, improves mood. I think most people know that. It reduces appetite. It affects pain sensitivity, regulates blood pressure, and impacts sleep. And the researchers were very clear, if you go back and read the study, that only carbohydrates do this, not protein and fat. And in fact, if you eat carbohydrate with a lot of protein, it can interfere with production of serotonin. Now, antidepressant medications are designed to regulate serotonin levels, but unlike carbohydrate, there are serious side effects, which include suicidal uh, ideation and increased risk of violence. They're expensive, they lead to comorbidities like weight gain and diabetes. On the other hand, carbohydrate-rich plant foods taste great, they're inexpensive, no negative side effects. I think, as it turns out, nature's given us not only a great way to keep our physical bodies in great shape, but a great way to keep our emotional and mental health in great shape as well. Now, Wortman's husband, Richard Wortman, is also associated with MIT, and he's conducted similar research. He and a graduate student discovered that the brain produces serotonin after eating sweet or starchy carbohydrates, and that, he also says, higher protein foods can actually interfere with the production of serotonin. So I think this explains a whole lot about what's going on today. First of all, since serotonin reduces appetite and serotonin is produced in response to carbohydrate eating, it might explain why people overeat. They're eating all this animal fat and protein and it stimulates more eating. Another thing is most people are eating too much fat and protein, so they're not producing enough serotonin, leading to increased risk of depression or incidence of depression. And the last thing is this probably explains why potatoes and pasta and bread are considered such comfort foods. They really are comfort foods as it turns out. So craving sweet foods like fruit and starchy foods like potatoes is the brain's way of instructing you that this is the right diet for humans and to eat those foods. All right, so the other thing's kind of related, less to do with emotion, more to do with brain health, and it has to do with vitamin D and brain health. You know, vitamin D, just like carbohydrate bashing is all the rage, promoting vitamin D supplementation is all the rage right now. And um, two studies on the same group of middle-aged people have both concluded that there is no relationship between vitamin D and cognitive function or cognitive decline. Now I keep bringing this up, some of you might be wondering why we're having, I don't know, the 12th message this year on vitamin D. It's because every day I get emails from people who think that they're vitamin D deficient or being told to take vitamin D to resolve health issues by health providers and it just doesn't work. So basically here are the results of the study. The first study looked at cognition and it showed that there was no relationship 
between lower levels of vitamin D and lower test scores on cognitive function at the beginning of the study, no relationship over a period of time in terms of changes in uh, cognition or scores, and no relationship to dementia risk. The second study involved MRI imaging on those very same people, and first at baseline and then 10 years later, and once again, no relationship between vitamin D and what those MRI images showed of the brain in terms of plaques and um, uh, white matter and that sort of thing. In an article covering these studies on Medscape Medical News, Erin Michos, an author of both studies, said, and this is a direct quote, she said, our results dampen the enthusiasm for vitamin D being a panacea for brain health. We're urging caution before everyone gets carried away with taking vitamin D. By the way, everybody's already carried away with taking vitamin D. And we cannot recommend it at this time uh, that people take it to protect against cognitive decline. She added, referring to vitamin D supplementation, it's not completely benign. It can cause side effects at high doses it's not a good idea to take supplements if you don't need to. And the reality is most people don't need to. Mitos also commented that research linking vitamin D to various diseases has only shown association, not cause and effect relationships. She stated that low vitamin D levels may be markers for disease. And if you go back and look in the Health Briefs Online Library at the articles that I've written and previous bright broadcasts on YouTube as well on our YouTube channel, you'll see that I've reported that very thing, that, that uh, vitamin D levels often resolve themselves when underlying conditions are addressed. So uh, one other thing she commented on with relationship to the studies on vitamin D and cognitive function is that lower levels of vitamin D have been associated with high blood pressure and diabetes, and those conditions are associated with increased risk for dementia. So the, what the researchers expected to find is that there would be a relationship when they did this study, and of course there wasn't even an association. So taking vitamin D as a strategy for preventing cognitive decline or reversing it is a worthless strategy. And I guess I would add to that, that taking vitamin D to prevent or reverse any disease is a worthless strategy. Very, very tiny segment of the population actually qualifies for supplementation and odds are you're not part of that population, so be cautious. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it and I'll be back to you again on Thursday.